So today let's continue fixing the oscilloscope from the previous episode. I already fixed a lot of problems in it and now I'm trying to fix the high voltage power supply which also generates the heater voltage for the CRT. It's using a DC heater voltage coming from a rectified and smooth winding on the high voltage transformer. And I noticed the heater voltage is fluctuating and quite unstable. It should be 6.3 volts and it's fluctuating anywhere between 4.2 volts and 6.1 volts. So I decided to test and replace the capacitors in the high voltage power supply control circuitry and the heater voltage smoothing capacitor. And this lower part of the board is the brightness control, which also has the Z input going into it. And the high voltage power supply control circuitry is just the top part of the board. So let's start changing and analyzing the capacitors. And of course the board is hard to remove. I would have to desolder a lot of wires around it. So I might actually end up just snipping the capacitors out and soldering the new ones to the pins. Let's remove this one for example. Let's leave a couple millimeters for the testing and a lot here for the soldering of the new capacitors. This is an old polyester capacitor made by Tesla. M47 minus 470 nano. 160 volts and the date code says it's 82. And the capacitor is sort of peeling and falling apart. Measuring the capacitance and it's actually very close to 470 nano. It's 511. Checking it for leakage current. It blinks and no more light. This one actually doesn't seem that bad. Now let's try to ring test it with the primary of this transformer which has a very high Q factor and it's going to show 15 rings. I have another 470 nano capacitor here and this one shows 22 rings. This one has a higher Q factor or lower dissipation factor. So I'm not going to put these ones back. I will replace them with these 470 nano 250 volt capacitors. The other old one is measuring lower. This one was measuring higher. And this one is spot on actually. One more, also very close. And soldering the new capacitors on the pins of the old ones. And of course you have to scratch the living hell out of the pins to solder on them. They are oxidized. Cleaning the shavings using my toothbrush. And of course when I was a kid I hated toothbrushing. As a child I wanted my freedom to stop brushing my teeth. But now I'm glad my parents didn't give me this freedom because now my teeth would be completely rotten. And this is the lazy way. Of course some soldering enthusiasts might be getting seizures now, but... And these polyester capacitors are in the voltage feedback of the high voltage power supply, as well as this small electrolytic one, which is coming next. To micro 160 volts. It's reading 2.65 and this one has a massive leakage current. Even if I pre-charge it, it actually self-discharges and the leakage current comes back. And this is leaking about 10 micro amps at just 10 volts, rated 160 volts. And measuring the ESR and it's just 1 ohm, which is actually not bad for such a low capacitance like 2 micro. And of course the lead is also have some resistance and inductance. The lead impedance mostly shows up for bigger capacitors with a high capacitance, which have a low ESR. These contacts are horrible in these terminals. I plan to solder permanently some thick wires into it and give it some gold-plated clips. And of course in different applications different things are critical. For example in this capacitor which is in a low current signal path in the voltage sensing feedback the capacitance isn't really that critical and the ESR isn't also critical, but the leakage current is very critical. In very low current or very high impedance circuit, the leakage current of the capacitor is quite significant. It can completely skew the behavior of the circuit. Whereas for example in some timing circuit or oscillator, the capacitance is the most important. And for example in a high current circuit, the ESR of the capacitor would be the most important. So let's try to replace the capacitor. And of course nowadays you typically don't get 2 micro. You have to use 2.2 micro, which is the closest. But the capacitance isn't very critical. This is not any oscillator or timer. And the original was 160 volts. I have a 100 volts or 450. And of course it's a bad idea to go lower, unless you are completely sure the voltage is never higher than this. So I'm going to use this 450 volt capacitor. 
the capacitance is very close to the nominal. And just for illustration, let's measure its ESR. And the ESR is actually about 8 bloody ohms. 2.2 micro 450 volts. When I measure the 100 volt rated capacitor, which is also 2.2 micro, it is just 0 0.7 ohms. So the same capacitance has a completely different ESR when it's a different voltage rating. And of course let's take a look at the schematic and what the capacitors do in it. Because otherwise it's just a blind the capacitor changing which doesn't teach anything. This is basically the switching high voltage power supply in the oscilloscope, generating some negative high voltages or positive high voltage and also the DC heater voltage for the CRT. And the high voltage regulation feedback is actually taken from the cathode negative high voltage. It goes through here and these voltage sensing resistors. And because it's a negative high voltage, it basically pulls the voltage down on the base of this transistor. It can be readjusted using this potentiometer. And when the high voltage is negative enough, it actually pulls the base of this one down, this one, this transistor turns off, this one turns off, this one turns off, and it no longer supplies a positive voltage into this oscillation feedback winding, going into the main switching transistor base. But of course in reality these transistors are operating in a linear region. When it reaches the right voltage at the output, they are no longer saturated, they are working in a linear region and reducing the positive voltage here for the feedback and this reduces the power of the power supply. And the 470 nanocapacitors are here and here in the feedback. This one decouples the voltage for the feedback winding going into the bias. And this one decouples the voltage feedback. And of course if this one has a leakage current, it completely skews this. This one would probably skew it if it went open circuit or high ESR or lower capacitance, because it would increase the impedance going into this bias. And the two micro capacitor I'm changing right now is here, and it's connected in a weird way. It's actually pulled to 120 volts via this 200 kilo ohm resistor. And of course in the old marking 200 kilo ohms is M2, basically like 0 0.2 mega ohms. It pulls this capacitor up, but it also is pulled down via this diode to 80 volts for some reason. Not sure why it's not connected straight to 80 volts. I guess it's to keep the voltage at 80 volts, but also to limit the current on it if it gets overloaded somehow. This basically regulates 80 volts on this capacitor unless you exceed a certain current. 120 minus 80 volts is 40 volts on a 200 kilo ohms. That's the current. And from this it goes into three 2.2 mega ohm resistors in parallel. Not sure why not just one resistor. And this pulls the base up and the feedback pulls it down so it balances at a certain specific voltage at the output here. And of course yes, when this capacitor has a leakage current, it pulls the voltage down here and the whole thing probably produces less voltage then. On the other hand, the ESR of this capacitor isn't really critical because it actually has a 100 ohm resistor in series. So having 7 ohms ESR doesn't really change much. And it definitely doesn't change much because the voltage from it goes into this feedback via resistors in a mega ohm range. And I could probably use the 100 volt capacitor, but I'm going to use the 450 volt one because its higher ESR isn't really a problem here. On the other hand, the 50 micro capacitor I'm going to change after this is a capacitor parallel to high current supply rail. 20 volts and probably quite high current. It's in a filter, interference filter with this inductor. So it's basically the only thing decoupling this supply rail. And this is switching at a high frequency at a high current. So there are high current pulses and this has to be decoupled using a capacitor with a low ESR. So here the capacitance isn't critical, the leakage current also isn't critical, this is a high current circuit. But the ESR, equivalent series resistance or impedance, is very critical. And of course they don't make 50 micro anymore, they make 47 or 100. You could actually put 100 here, because typically higher capacitances have lower ESR. You can use a higher capacitance because it's not critical. It can be double, but probably not 10 times, because then you have a massive inrush when you turn it on. And of course they also make 56, 68 and 82 microfarad capacitors, but these are not as common. The most common electrolytic capacitors are 1 micro, 2.2, 4.7, 10, 22, 47, 100, and so on. And the leakage current of the 2.2 micro capacitor, it blinks, charges, and no more current. Let's try to measure it. It charges and then it's not even measurable, I guess. 
So the 2.2 micro 450 volt capacitor is horribly botched in and now let's go for the 50 micro decoupling capacitor for the supply rail. It's measuring 63 micro which itself wouldn't be a problem. And of course 50 micro for that application seems sort of low to me. And it's measuring 0 0.35 ohms ESR. Of course it would be better if it was lower. And let's compare different 47 micro capacitors. This is 47 micro 63 volts. Slightly under 0 0.3 ohms. 47 micro 100 volts. And the ESR is way lower. And that's actually the opposite of what it was with the 2.2 micro capacitors. And the higher voltage rating had a higher ESR, but here a higher voltage rating has a lower ESR. So the ESR doesn't depend just on the capacitance and the voltage rating, but also on the particular capacitor and the technology. Some of them are specifically made to have a low ESR. Some of them are just general use capacitors. And going even higher with the voltage rating, 47 micro, 200 volts. And it went back up to about 0 0.36 ohms. So the 100 volt one definitely wins here. Let's do a similar comparison for 100 micro capacitors. And 100 micro 25 volts is 0 0.4 ohms almost ESR. And I can't use this one anyway because the original is 35 volts. Now let's try a 100 micro 35 volt capacitor. And it's just about 60-ish milli ohms. Very low. Let's go even higher with the voltage rating, 100 micro 63 volts, and the ESR goes back up. So yes, typically a higher capacitance has a lower ESR, but there is really no specific correlation between the voltage rating and the ESR. A higher voltage rating can have both higher or lower ESR. And these 47 micro capacitors are reading just 43. Well, I can just stick a 100 micro into it. And that's properly botched and now let's progress to the capacitor smoothing the heater voltage, which is here. Here it's basically the secondary 1 ohm resistor, the bridge rectifier, the capacitor and the heater. Here is the capacitor 500 micro 10 volts, reading about 600 micro. And it seems that these old capacitors don't lose capacitance. Very often the capacitance is actually higher, probably because the aluminium oxide layer in it is getting thinner as it deteriorates. And this also causes a leakage current. But of course in some cases over time it reforms in operation if it's connected via a low impedance to a voltage. If it's connected to a voltage via a high resistance or impedance then the leakage current keeps pulling the voltage down. And the ESR is just 36 milli ohms. And this actually looks like a good capacitor but you never know. It can actually be intermittent or it can only have problems under higher current, higher voltages or higher temperature. Sometimes components actually have problems in the circuit yet they might test good. Testing components isn't always easy. I'm not putting it back, it might have some hidden problems. Let's try to find a replacement. The closest is 470 micro. This one is 16 volts. And it's actually showing the same ESR. 470 micro 35 volts actually has a way higher ESR. And another 470 micro 35 volts. And this one has just 27 milli ohms ESR. As you can see two capacitors, the same capacitance and the same voltage rating, but each of them has a different ESR, like four or five times difference. And 470 micro 50 volts. This one is somewhere in between. I'll use the 16 volt capacitor. It should be enough for this application. The original is 10 volts and it's supposed to have 6.3 volts on it. But before putting the capacitor in, let's check the reverse leakage current of the bridge rectifier diodes. It's a bridge made of discrete diodes. No leakage current at about 10 volts. Measuring the forward voltage drops of the diodes, 570-ish millivolts. This one as well. The third one as well. And the last one. And this one is actually 508. One of the diodes has a noticeably lower voltage drop than the other three. And of course this is tricky. Is it a normal variation or is it a sign of some problem? You never know. Sometimes testing components isn't as easy as finding a completely dead shorted component or open circuit component. Sometimes the values are just a bit drifted, a bit higher leakage current, higher ESR, a slightly different voltage drop. You never know if it's normal or a sign of a problem or if it's enough to stop the machine from working properly. Here are the four diodes. And of course this bridge rectifier has a very low impedance going in because it's connected to the low voltage secondary via 1 ohm resistor. 
And it also has a very low impedance at the output because it's loaded by the heater of the CRT, low resistance and even lower when cooled. So he had to desolder one of the secondaries of the transformer from it and he also took the socket of the CRT. Otherwise it's not possible to measure the diodes because when both the input and the output of a bridge rectifier is connected to a low impedance it effectively puts all four diodes in parallel, two going one way, two the other way. To measure them I had to disconnect it. Sometimes it's not possible to measure components in a circuit. But for now let's assume the small differences in the voltage drops are not a problem. Let's put the new capacitor in, let's reconnect what I have disconnected and let's test it. Maybe after the replacement of these five capacitors it will work. This one measures 472 micro. I have to prolong one of the leads. The capacitor is botched in, quite a laparoscopy. And whatever you disconnect for the measurements, don't forget to reconnect, putting the socket back on the CRT and there is a key, yet actually the center is a smaller diameter and it still allows it to be put on the wrong way. This is the right way, I guess. So everything's reconnected. Let's try to plug it in and measure the heater voltage. And again, it's a couple volts between the terminals, but it can be over a kilovolt in reference to ground. So I'm floating the meter here in a dodgy way again and powering it. And this looks like a nice heater voltage, close to 6.3 nominal. The tolerance is about plus minus 10%. It seems to work. The heater voltage is stable. It's running for about 25 minutes, it settled at this and it doesn't change. Of course there is a potentiometer to adjust it, but this actually changes the heater voltage and the high voltages proportionally. So I'm not sure I want to turn it. The heater voltage is close enough. And of course changing the high voltage also changes the sensitivity of the deflection of the CRT. The lower the high voltage, the more sensitive the CRT is to deflection, both vertically and horizontally. So with a lower high voltage the picture gets bigger. And with a higher voltage it gets smaller. So changing the high voltage can throw off all the time base and voltage calibration per division. Well, for education let's actually try to turn the potentiometer. I can always turn it back where it was, looking at the heater voltage and setting it to the original value. Now I'm putting 1 kilohertz into it at half a millisecond per division and you can see it nicely aligns with the divisions, so the time base calibration is right. Now turning the potentiometer up actually makes everything shrink, both vertically and horizontally. You don't want to go up too much and turning it down and everything is bigger now, both vertically and horizontally. Turning it up, down, up, down. And I've put it roughly where it was. Strangely increasing the high voltage reduces the brightness, but it's probably because it also changes several different voltages and influences a lot of things. So now I guess everything in the high voltage cabinet is fixed, so I can put the cover back on it. And of course sometimes just looking at the inside of the cover tells you where the problem is. That was the arcing from the previous episode. Putting the cover back on. So now the brightness control finally works properly and it's quite bright. It's actually not a worn CRT, but I still have to fix the synchronization. It only works now in the TV mode. And only in one polarity. This is flickering. This is working. Automatic, nothing. Low frequency, high frequency. only works in the TV mode still. What looked like a bad brightness potentiometer ended up something completely different, a bit more laborious to repair, but I'm not complaining. It could have been the CRT, the high voltage transformer or a multiplier, but even these things could be probably fixed. The CRT can be replaced, I could probably rebuild the high voltage multiplier and the transformer probably isn't in resin. It's not a super high voltage because it uses the multiplier, so even the transformer probably could be rewinded. What I like about these old things is that just about everything can be fixed in it. So that's it for today and in the next episode let's fix the time base or synchronization. And of course if you made it that far, please consider supporting this channel on Patreon, subscribing or using the thanks button. Because making these videos is bloody laborious and it takes a lot of time.